Lovely. Uh, if I could just get you to clap, uh, just to sync up everything. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll start us off by chatting about Henley, because uh, Henley is something that I've raced, and of course you've raced it uh, probably a, a fair few times. I couldn't find a number of an exact number of times you've raced it, but I know you've, you've won it a, a good few times as well. Um, so um, when, when was the last time you raced Henley? Did you do it in yeah, 2022? 20, 2021 I did it. It was in the last the time. Diamonds. Yeah, that's right. So obviously with the, it was a tricky one because I had to, en had to enter before the Olympics because of the, cl the closing date. So, and I wasn't definitely sure I was going to do it, but I thought, you know what? It'd be nice to have the option and you know, you can always, you can always pull out, even though that's a bit naughty of the stewards, but threw an entry in there and obviously was disappointed with the fourth in Tokyo. And I felt like Henley was like the perfect soft landing really from, from like an Olympic come down. And also the like COVID pressure cooker that the Olympic build up had been like to get back and just in amongst people that were like just getting on with life was was really really great experience and so I was so grateful for the there being a regatta held in August which obviously is a rarity uh, so yeah that was a that was the last time I raced yeah and I, I rewatched your final today um, just to bring me up to speed it looked like um, a fairly comfortable but a hard working race for you. Did you, did you find the whole regatta was fairly comfortable for you? Did you just cruise through? Uh, to be honest, like, when you when you peak for something like the Olympic Games, like and that was like five years in the making, my, I felt like my physiology was like falling off a cliff. And like, I, did, I really did show the event respect in the two weeks leading up to it. So I went back to Agecroft, like I did some training pieces against their four, like, like which were really, really tough. Uh, and it was obviously good for both of us like to really like you know thrash it out and obviously I was cut up, coming up against like basically the guys that are like queuing up to make the team this year so I've got George Bourne on the Friday uh, who's now a world silver medalist in the quad uh, and yeah I was worried because it like anybody could have been a banana skin for me because I was like I said holding on to what little physiology I had left and I really just had, I think some, some of my best sculling was done at Henley because I didn't have the, maybe the physical ability just to muscle it down the course. Uh, and then, yeah, again, coming up against Seb in the final, uh, you know, he said to me afterwards in, in the bar, he was like, look, it, you, he's like, you were the only guy I was worried about entering, uh, which, you know, big compliment. But again, it was, I've been beaten 10, like, well, nine years ago in that Diamonds final and I just wasn't about to lose another one yeah. uh, because I just, like, single sculling when you're losing is just absolutely miserable. Uh, you know, you've, you've no crews to bounce, you've no crew mates to bounce off and, like, I know I've lost before in crews at Henley and it is disappointing but you kind of just rally around each other and you get going whereas in the single it's a very, very lonely place to be to, to get beaten in a final. So, yeah, I just wasn't, I was just, mind over matter basically, I wasn't going to let that happen. Um, so, um, previously at, uh, at Henley, you've, you've won in, in a quad, in a four? A uh, quad, yeah, quad and a double. So I've won all three uh, oh, open sculling events. Yeah. That's fantastic. I'm still aiming for, well, just get through a few rounds with, uh, yeah. with a sweep, but we'll, we'll build up to, to those at some stage. Um, so you, you joined uh, British Rowing through GB Starts. That's right, yeah. What, what triggered, so you, you were a rugby union player before, yeah. um, what triggered your switch over? Uh, so I, I was playing second row, but I'd played second row for most of my rugby career, uh, getting caps for Lancashire from age like 15 on to the under 20s. And like that season was like, obviously I started playing senior rugby at 18, but then like the Lancashire age group stuff obviously stops at 20 and I, I passed that kind of age marker. And then my club I was playing for, Sale FC, they switched me to winger. And well, going back a really long time, the whole reason I switched to, uh, well, I played rugby in the first place because I couldn't play football. 
Like pre the currency of the currency of sport in Preston is football, and I have an absolute banana boot. Like you just, <laughs> there's no guarantee where that ball is going to go. So rugby was perfect because my hand-eye coordination didn't seem too bad. So got stuck into rugby and like yeah, got like did some quite good achievements from like not really expecting much of it, especially from my mum and dad who just like wanted to do me do anything. Uh, but when I got switched to winger, I knew that I, there was going to be some shortcomings in my ability because I still couldn't kick. No matter how much I practice, I just don't have very good like coordination with my feet. Uh, so we played one. I played one season on wing with a lot of catching and running back rather than kicking to touch. Which, and I had aspirations of like trying to make it, you know, semi-pro pro, and I realised that. Those, those aspirations were like, they were becoming a bit of a dead end. Uh, and it was a case of, you know, keep like just rolling along, maybe, you know, getting a like 100 quid in your shoe or so before a game or whatever, or like really trying to take on like another sport. Uh, so I asked my housemate, I was like, look, I'm from Preston. I've never rowed. Like, how, how do you do rowing? Because he'd learn at school. And he said, oh, there's a scheme for tall people. That's how he, that's what he said. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Like, what happens? He's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure they give you a boat and a coach. And I was like, mm, right, that sounds like quite serious. So I emailed British Row and said, look, I've heard that there's this scheme. And like the website said it was called Start. I said, how do I get on it? And thankfully, Hamish Borrelin at Agecroft was running a centre there. So I gave him a call. And he was like, oh yeah, loads of people think they can be rowers, but it's really tough. Like, we'll give you a try, but you know, I don't think you'll make it kind of thing, you're old. And like, I don't think he was doing that, like, that was the first test basically, because I, I reckon he probably gets loads of calls from people saying, oh yeah, I want to be an Olympic row or whatever. And like, if you can't even, if you don't even have the belief that somebody can tell you that you probably won't be able to make it, and you just go, oh, I won't bother then then you probably don't have the kind of mindset to actually even do it in, in the first place. So I passed the first test, went down to the rowing club and the start tests are like a dyno thing, like leg press and then press and pull with the arm and the uh, arm bike, the sh like Schwinn bike or assault bike, I think the CrossFit as uh, uh, yeah. call them. And I, I mean, I did, did relatively okay on those and he was like, yeah, you're all right, we'll take you on. Uh, and yeah, the rest of the day is history. Oh, fantastic. So when you joined Start, was it straight into sculling? Or were you mixed up? Were you, did you ever go into sweet boats? Or? No, it's purely purely sculling. Uh, and the coach, Hamish, was like, look, you learn the fastest by being in a, in a single. So he actually put me out in one of those uh, virus playboats. <laughs> okay. Uh, and it became a laughing joke because there was guys like Brendan Crean down there and Olivia Whitlam... They both had M packers and had, you know, were, had been in the squad and were choosing to train at Agecroft with Ham Hamish. And I was in my yellow boat, this yellow like, and they were just laughing the socks at me because I, every, every time one of them come, would come past me on the river, I'd pull as hard as I could and like the drag on that thing, I don't, yeah. I don't know, it was, it was awful. But I was in that for two and a half months Oh my gosh. And everyone was like, Hamish, when are you going to put him in like a real boat? Like, this is a bit of a joke. Uh, and they're like, no, his blade work is still getting better. Uh, and that was his big philosophy that if he removed the balance skill from the equation and just made it about blade work, when you actually eventually got in the single, your blade work was already there. And then you just had to learn the balance. Uh, and well, he actually had to go away to, I think, I think he was going like under 23s or something, one of, one of his like more senior athletes. And it was Lydia Birch, who some people might know from the tide wave going back a long time. Uh, she was at uh, UL. And she snuck me out in a single while Hamish was away. And so I went out in the single school and like fell in like 17 times or whatever. But after a couple of days of doing that, when Hamish came back, I was like, look, Hamish, I'm in a, a single. And he was like, he wasn't happy about it, but he let me stay in it. And I got to go to the first world-class start camp uh, in August. So it was a good time of year to start rowing and bowling in all the time. Amazing. That's a great story about being, being stuck, in, stuck in the virus. 
Um, I, can't, I don't think I've ever rode in a virus. I've, I've, we had some up in Sheffield where I learned to row, but we were um, the novice program up, up there was straight into a, an old uh, Janicek eight yeah, yeah. and never even touched sculling. Uh, so have you? So you started in sculling. You're obviously sculling now. Have you ever touched sweep? Uh, so myself and Zach Lee Green, uh, he's from Cardiff. We took a pair out at Landeth and and did some pairs rowing uh, for a week while we were just staying there. It's like a we did like a mini training camp in Cardiff. Just we neither of us had any money, so it's like, well, where can we go that feels like a change of scenery? So we just went to Cardiff for a week, and we did some sweep there just to see what it was like, really, just a, a curiosity uh, thing. Uh, but it'll probably shock you to hear that I've never been in a four or an eight. Oh gosh! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, uh, which yeah is no, it's, it's it is a funny it's a funny thing. I don't know if I'll be able to go my whole career without getting one. And I was fortunate enough to be invited to do like a great eight this winter, uh, but I kind of just had to politely decline, and it didn't really fit with the schedule of GB anyway. But it would have been like. <laughs> I would have, I'm not sure I could like end up breaking a rib from like getting hit by the oil or something. I don't know. Uh, I don't. Know. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so let's jump on to the to the exciting stuff of, of the GB squad. So you've been in the squad ten years now. Yeah, ten years. Yeah. And your your first Olympic cycle didn't end the way you would have wanted it to. Um, no, not at all. Uh, yeah, well, I was like. I started rowing in 2009, so London was like a bit of a, a bit of a dream, really. But I, kept, I did come incredibly close to making that 2012 team. Uh, in the end, getting to go on the like pre-Olympic camps and train alongside Alan, uh, who like we've been friends ever since that, and it was really amazing. The, you know the Legends race that was out in Richichi. Alan was there, so Alan watched me get my bronze this summer. So that was like really awesome because I've been, you know, we have chats from now and again, and uh, obviously he's a Wingfields winner, like multiple Wingfields winner. So we got to go on the either the the decennial cruise. So we we're like, you know, catching up there, and we always keep in touch. So it's nice to uh, yeah, like have that like long lasting friendship with another single scholar. Oh, fantastic. Um, jumping forward to 2016, um, that was another Olympiad that didn't yeah, go yeah. the way you wanted to. Are yeah, you, are so, you okay to talk yeah, about that? Yeah, of course, that? yeah. Uh, so, to kind of set the scene a little bit, so GB had never won an, inter, uh, like an international uh, medal in the, in the quad in any, at any age group at that point. So, junior, under 23 or senior, no one had won an international medal, which is it's baffling really how it gets so late in rowing's history it was in sculling's history that we were still at that point but 2013 myself uh, pete lambert charles cousins and sam Tanza won the first ever world medal in a quad uh, bronze and so and then the following year we improved on that over silver and then we qualified the boat in egg in 2015 with a fourth place uh which was a uh, particularly tricky year and that's maybe where the wheels started to fall off a little bit because Charles had had quite a serious back injury that year and come in and then had to withdraw in the in the Olympic year in 2016 uh, around February time uh, so you know that for me the, the the trials went pretty well and we were putting a lineup of uh, Pete Lambert, Sam Townsend and Angus Groom and you know we had a little bit of a tricky uh, kind of World Cup seri- series, but in the end we managed to come away from Lucerne with a silver, uh, which you know put us feeling you know that there was there was conf- there, there was confidence that we could deliver something. Uh, so it's just a case of getting getting to the games, but uh, sadly it was like a whole like catalogue of errors. Really, when I look back and reflect on decisions that I made, decisions that other people made. Uh, that basically led to me getting like a virus that was basically induced by basically overtraining. Uh, I was so run down uh, that I got this inopportune virus like four or five days before the heat. Gosh, uh, that's so so upsetting. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those. It was 
the doctors like one Anne Redgrave was like wondering or like is he gonna is he gonna get better is it just like is it just a little bit of a cold but then I was I was quite ill for about 48 hours but then you know immediately started to feel better and I was like oh I can race I can race uh, but in the end they decided you know when you when you've had a virus like that is there's like risk of heart complications and and things like that so it was it, the decision was taken out of my hands to be honest. David Hanna came into my room because I was in isolation because they were worried that it might have been something that was contagious and came in and said, "Look, your Olympics is over. Uh, what do you want to do?" And I don't know, like whether it was the right or wrong decision, but I said, "Just get me out of here." To be honest, uh, like if I can't race, like there was there was there was no point in being there really. Uh, and end up commentating for BBC Radio Berkshire on most of the road uh, from Leander Club, which was a very, very, very surreal experience, really. And it was also strange because people were seeing me like looking fit and healthy and were like, why aren't you racing? Like, you look fine. And I was, for all intents and purposes, I felt absolutely fine. And I think that also really made it difficult to kind of bounce back from quickly because if somebody had asked me to like do a 2k ago I felt like I could have put something pretty pretty good down it might not be my absolute best but uh and but that's sport and it these things happen and uh yeah yeah so how how did you you obviously have bounced back from that but how there's such a uh, huge setback it's it took it took a really long time and I think it took a lot of uh took a lot of mind mindset shifts and also like reevaluating like how I approached ev- like everything in my life really because uh, I think you know I was maybe what was I 25 26 I can't remember my exact age but I come into a sport like relatively quickly risen to the top been winning stuff that people hadn't won before like in the sculling team you know was you know I was second at every single trial that in in that Olympic cycle behind Eva Allen or behind Charles, uh, you know, and I was flying high on confidence. You could even say I was maybe a bit arrogant, uh, and it became all about the Olympics and the medal and getting that. And it was kind of like, oh, I'll get the medal and then I'll go do something else because I'll like have this big shiny medal and maybe maybe a bit too brash like that. Uh, and then obviously. My mental health was just completely wiped out uh, after that, and somebody sat me down and said, "Look, you know, I I was I was kind of determined to carry on. Like that's I got I turned up back to Carriage from the start of training for the new Olympic cycle, and I was like, right, I'm kind of going to do this because uh, I didn't really know what else to do apart from carry on. Uh, so just kind of got stuck in, but." not really just muddling through really and someone said you know if this this could happen again so so then what and you're like well geez like imagine training for another four years and like the outcome like being like not happening again and that makes you switch to it becoming about the day-to-day because if you can't go and win a medal like or that opportunity is taken away from you like can you look back and say, well, that was like four years well spent? And I think that's definitely what I took forward from like 2017 onwards was that enjoying the journey, enjoying the day to day. And it's made me a much happier person as well, uh, rather than it being like medal, medal, medal. Like, and it definitely helped me come back from Tokyo incredibly quickly, like mentally just bounce back from that uh, disappointment as well because it was it was a journey rather than it being about like an end M- product you know John and I've you know we've debriefed that race there's nothing else we could we that we were in control of that we could have done differently that was the best we could do uh, all the COVID circumstances aside like that and that was that so you you know you're disappointed but it doesn't take you long to walk away and go, you know what, fourth place Olympics, it's not, it's not that bad. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of, the, obviously Rio is a, a sad thing to happen, but 
actually I think it's made me a better person, a nicer person, uh, like a more humble, grateful person, which I think now like I actually see my own career being far longer than having had that happen to me than if I'd gone and we'd got like a silver or you know maybe even one or whatever like maybe I've just been like you know like macho or whatever and now I'm off I'm gonna go and do something else and win that do you know what I mean like like it, it, it taught me it taught me a hard life lesson uh, and yeah I think yeah I'm, to say like I'm glad it happened is probably is yeah still a bit of a like a funny thing to say but like I guess I wouldn't change it now yeah yeah but it's 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 really comforting I suppose to, to take a massive positive out of something that's so heartbreaking at the time um, do you so do you think that it's so you're saying it's, it's, it's changed your whole approach to life really and training. Do you think it's made you like a stronger athlete in, in terms of your fitness? Are you able to, does it make you train harder or just train differently? Uh, yeah, I'm not really, I think I've become a less emotional athlete as the years have gone on. I think I'm sure it's not just myself, but I think most athletes could probably relate to when you're younger, maybe in your like late teens, your early twenties, there's that, you know, a bit of anger, you know, like you want to prove yourself. Uh, and so, you know, you're hammering yourself on the ergo and you, cause you want to knock down doors. You want to like make a statement. You want people to kind of be like, Oh wow. That's like somebody, uh, whereas for me, I don't know, like that, that need for kind of external like applause seems to have like like so steadily gone down down of course like you want the head coach to appreciate you you consistently grafting away and acknowledge that you're doing a good job like like any normal person would in any job you want some just some acknowledgement that you're on the right track and you're doing the right thing but that kind of emotional drive to be like oh I'm go- I, I want to show everybody I want to show I want to be a big name kind of thing like that's really faded away now. I'm I'm doing it for me and my kind of just personal enjoyment of the challenge every day. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe that maybe that means on some days like I'm not training as hard or like I'm not like on the limit or past the limit as much. But I'm a far more consistent trainer than I ever was back then because when you have the, when you use emotion to produce a performance. Like yeah, you can get you can produce something very special some sometimes, but it's not uh, it's not sustainable. Yeah, it, it's quite depleting after a while, uh, and so that's what I found now is that I'm like, and maybe this season in the singles kind of showing that that like, I wouldn't say I was emotional for any of the races, but I just just hammered just hammered away and yeah, that's that was that. <laughs> Um, so just to, to carry on almost, um, to, talking about the emotions in sports. Um, so the single skull is often seen as quite a lonely place and um, sometimes people say you have to be a bit of a psycho to be able to train in it for years on end or for even weeks or months on end because it can be so lonely out there. How, how, do, you, how do you manage it? Uh... I think I've got a really good memory for song lyrics. <laughs> so I just kind of sing along to myself. If I've got enough air, then I'll sing out out loud. If I, if I haven't, then I'll just sing in my head. Uh, and that's mainly how I get through uh, the mundane training. Uh, it's, it's been really fun this year because the men's eight have been quite a young, buoyant boat. And they, I, I don't know, they've, they've really like kind of carried me at times in you know, just usually like, like kind of hanging on to their momentum a little bit and just, it's always the case with a team, like the men's eight is such a large percentage, like however they're going, that the mood of eight people, nine people really affects everybody else. So 
yeah, it was good. It was really great to have a successful men's eight this year because it meant that generally, you know, there's a lot of extroverts. There was a lot of confidence that was like bubbling away, and it, it, it it's nice to bounce off. And you know, the, I don't know whether it, I, I can't confirm whether it's true or not, but I think the fact that the eight and myself were doing the exact same training, I think it maybe kept them a little bit quieter about being tired and moaning about things a little bit because it's because maybe I don't maybe I don't know I'm speculating here maybe the coach was like well Graham's doing it like you're moaning about 20k he's doing it 20k in the single like do you know what I mean I, I, and I don't know maybe that maybe that helped them stay positive and and just stay focused or whatever and like they're kind of like appreciation that they had it easier in 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 a way uh, that I was just like yeah slogging it away in the single uh, w- was nice um so uh, do you do most of your training on the water or is there yeah, I'm guessing you must spend a hell of a lot of time on the erg as well yeah so I think what Paul's really brought in that's been great is this like idea of an aerobic cross training session that is kind of up to the athlete what modality they choose to do so yeah some people do choose to ergo if they think that ergo is something specific they need to target or you know improve uh, but for myself I've been taking the opportunity to do a lot more cycling uh, I've had two hip arthroscopies so it's good to like unload from that like deep compression position to something a little bit more opened up and go out on the bike and I've got a power meter and you know it's all very honest in terms of what training I'm doing so that, that's that's been really nice and I think it's really helped balance out the, the maybe I've mainly just been sculling once a day to be honest on the water so you go in real big technical focus uh, and you know that's your one row of the day so you've got to you kind of not going to get it right because it's not it's just training but there's that real intent about it yeah uh, and then when you know you're just going to go and like there's no there's no real skill side to cycling it's just turn your legs and and, and go and don't fall off <laughs> So like that 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 was definitely nice to break it up a little bit and yeah that's I'd say that's been working well. So you're still doing all the traditional five k's and two k's oh, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah the the actual ergo tests they they haven't escaped no uh, no I haven't escaped from those. It's, I think we might maybe got like a a, a benchmarking five k before Christmas just to see where we're at before the, like the actual kind of selection 5k that will be used in January to rank everybody and a two, the 2k's and all that yeah the, the kind of bread and butter stuff the 30 minute rate 20 none of those things have really changed they're still they're still there and I think it would be silly to scrap them anyway because there's just so much historic data yeah that you can compare squads going back you know two decades uh, because of the C2 machine's reliability for its like consistent results so like as much as nobody really likes the ergo like it's a it's a valuable tool and you know that's one of the first things somebody said to me when I first started Roman I said oh I hate the ergo and my coach was like well you shouldn't attach like an emotion to it and then somebody else was like it's really useful like you should like just see it for what it is uh, and again I'd say that's my approach now it just just something you've got it's just part of the sport it's something you've got to do just you know put a good playlist on and get on with it yeah um we am i, am I allowed to ask you 2ks and 5k skills? yeah i have no problem with that yeah uh so i'm four, 548 on the c2 and 1521 on the for a 5k God, that's, yeah. that's speedy no wonder you're flying away in the single <laughs> um so um you were saying but before we switched the cameras on that um, after the Gold Cup and spending time with all the other elite scholars out there that you felt like your training's very similar to, to their training. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that. But yeah, so, you know, to put it in like a, just a, like a, a phrase, Jürgen used to say, like, everybody's cooking with water. Uh, so you know like n- there's nobody got anything special like you you know that that's what, or, or and you say you know they're only human and you know 
it'd be interesting to see what their takeaways were from having having chatted with me but it really feels like the whole world is doing i'd say minimum 80 percent the exact same training at the elite level and there's a few like you know kind of rogue sessions here and there but the general rule of thumb is you know miles and miles and you know some variation on s and c strength training and a lot of people are using cross training as a like a valuable tool to add extra volume into the program without you know breaking people and like you know consistent training is better than like a you know doing a huge block of rowing and then everyone just falling over with back or hip or rib injuries or something like that so yeah there's there's nothing like specifically that i could say like oh they do that session or they do that like you know you we're kind of scrapping over like well they have they turn up you know the dutch have between like eight and nine in the morning to turn up and start the session and that just helps stagger the coaching because not everyone wants to turn up at eight somebody want to turn up at nine and every, so then everyone gets a look with the coach it's just it's just little things about more how each individual centers run and there's there's pros and cons to all of them but for me it was i got a real confidence boost that you know like i'm sure you know that you know with uh, ollie and melvin they're going to want to be keeping me behind them and i'm thinking well you know my first year in the single and it's they're not you know Ollie's a big strong guy but the, his, his training isn't anything like that is like, I'm not jealous of his physiology or something like that do you know what I mean like he's he's just he's just training hard and he's a big strong guy uh, so uh, it's like quite exciting to, to to go you know what like maybe I could do another year in the single and see what happens um, another interesting aspect of being in the single is that people seem to make friends, real close friends with their competitors. Um, so you mentioned a few names already, but would you say that you're at that level yet? Have you, are you, uh, do you, do you know your competitors really well? Uh, yeah, I mean, if I saw them around the boat park, I'd definitely stop and have a chat with them, unless they, you know, they had clearly had their sunglasses and headphones on, and they're yeah. just in 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 race mode or whatever. Like, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't bother somebody if they were, they kind of had that body language. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's a few of us bouncy idea. You know, like when we were sat around having dinner, like, or if anyone wants to come and stay at my house, if they're over in the UK, like, let us know, and you know, their offer was reciprocated, that kind of thing, and. You know, like, I think that's what's great about it. any rower can relate to that. Like you, you might have had an amazing race with somebody at Henley and gone for beers, and then been like, "Oh, if you want to come train on our stretch sometime, you know, that would be really good fun." Like the the kind of language of rowing is universal, and I think that's like a really, really special part of of the sport is that you can go anywhere in the world and walk into a rowing club and and feel you know reasonably welcome. Uh, and that people are gonna like look out for you, and and so that that's that's really great. And I'd say that's probably I'm not gonna start saying oh I'm best friends with these people because uh, you know it, it's probably gonna go quiet again until you know this you know hopefully stood on the podium next to each other again, and then we'll be like oh you know how did you win to go oh yeah clearly went all right kind of thing. Uh, but there'll always be that respect, and I think when it's probably easiest to see when you step away. And I referred to that the legends race that happened in Machichi at the World Championships. You just go to show there, like those guys are like, you know, quite a long time now out the game, but you know, they were out in Prague, like getting absolutely, you know, beard up. At, you know, Andre Sinek's taking them to the best beer house in the city, uh, and the, you know, they're the partying like it's 1999, like having an absolute whale of a time. And these are blokes that used to knock ten bells out of each other. Uh, so it just shows like maybe you don't see it right now whilst everybody's in amongst it and you know everyone's striving to achieve their dreams and their goals or whatever like you're not going to see those tight-knit relationships yeah. immediately but like that underlying respect uh, is, is always going to be there and that's I think something you see maybe later on down the line yeah it's a real beautiful aspect of, of the sport and it's I as, as far as I've seen in other sports I've played, I don't think it's something that's quite 
uh, as true to, to other sports as it is to rowing. It's, it seems a real bond amongst uh, rowers. Um, so you're, you're someone who's been in rowing uh, a long time now and, and in GB a long time as well. So I've got a lot of uh, younger rowers who watch this channel. So do you have any advice for, for them, someone young or getting into the sport? Uh, I think like what like one thing that's it kind of applies to all sports really, but it's, it's like seek out experts. Uh, like you can't be expected to know absolutely everything. Uh, so so be curious, ask questions. Uh, in rowing, ev like everyone's got some like an opinion in rowing. Uh, so you know, so listen and you know don't don't change everything. It's like when you're making a, if you're making a call in a boat and you say like oh do X and then like they do the, the change is made by the crew but then you lose something else it's like just just a little one percent here and there uh, but you know like, like I said earlier try and start learning to row in the summer because it's nice when you fall <laughs> yeah. in uh, and and just tough it out like anything like it's it's, it, it's there's a huge technical element to rowing so it's not going to come overnight and you you kind of got to the better you get and the more you put in the more rewarding it is uh, so you, it does it does take a lot of time and you got you got to stick at it but it, it is worth it because you'll make lifelong friends and you'll open doors that you never thought kind of were possible uh, and that's there's such a great a great network in rowing that you know you you stick with it and you make friends and you know you you're always gonna have you're always gonna have somebody who wants to help you out whether that be with a career or if you're you know in a tricky situation or whatever so yeah I'd just, like if you're a new new rower like you know welcome to the sport and uh, yeah don't be afraid to ask questions I think that's great advice um, I mean just a just a few quicker quicker fire questions for you um, do you have a, a favorite drill what what's the drill you go to to, oh. to really find your speed? Well, coming from world class start, we had to do drills to get promoted to the next group above, and I always got the speed, but I never passed the drills. So I've got a bit of a love hate relationship with drills because I used to call them dressage and say that they didn't matter. But uh, I have found now <laughs> there's a more mature head on me. Uh, that they do have their place and they are very useful uh, but you know for me I just look I, I love perfecting my front end so just you know like some some half half legs from the front or something square blade I think can really help both in a single and in a crew as well just you know get it you know if you can get everyone timing like their work onto the foot plate then the kind of rest takes care of itself so that's that would be my top drill yeah, I, I like that one. I'm I'm a big fan of the legs only stuff. Um, and uh, so a conversation I was, I was having with uh, one of the chaps behind the bar was that in a single, his his theory is that you can get away with pretty much anything if you're strong. So strength or technique, if you could oh. only pick one. It's got to be. It's got to be technique. It, you know, you, you look you look back over the years and you know, our Olympic champion from last year from Greece, you know, he's not the strongest on the ergo, but on that on that day he delivered, you know, like the technique that those conditions needed. Uh, you know you some people might be going, Oh, five forty eight, that's like a huge ergo or whatever, but like it's not in the world of rowing. Like there's people eight, fifteen seconds quicker than that. Uh so yeah, it's got to be technique. That's great advice, I think. Um, so Graham, thank you so much for coming down. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. No, oh, thanks very much, Mike. Thanks for having me and showing me around Vesta Rowing Club. I've not been in, in here before, so it's nice. Oh, you're always welcome down. <laughs> uh, brilliant, thank you. Um, no let's just.